UFOs don't crash, they don't burn up, they don't have blow up in the sky, they don't parts don't drop off them. They call them gifts, they call them gathering fields. This is the phenomena that is producing and it sacrifices, it sacrifices technology, it sacrifices biologic to advance humankind. It's been doing that for a long, long time. And it's the same with our space program. We would never be in space if it wasn't for NHI. They're the ones that helped us get there by downloaded information or ritualistic practices that the hierarchy of jet propulsion laboratories, not just JPL, but many others around the world, have all been invoked into these communications and it got us to the stars. This is why you don't realize, and many people don't, that they're paying homage all the time about getting into space. This is why when he went to the moon, first flag wasn't the American flag, it was the Masonic flag. Welcome back. I'm here with Steve Mera. Steve, welcome back. Ah, thank you for having me on, Sean. It's a pleasure. So, dogmen. Mm. Real or just kind of distant mythology? It's a good question. I do believe people have those experiences. I've interviewed many people that have witnessed these strange cryptids. And I believe they're being sincere. I mean, when you've got people in tears and you can see that they're reliving the event when they're looking and trying to relive that moment. And, they can't, and you can see their eyes casting over to the left and side as if they were there, as if they had witnessed these things. You know, people have been in vehicles and had confrontations with these things. In the UK, you know, in a place called Canet Chase, which is very well known for those type of incidents. I do believe people having them, and I have no reason not to, because I've seen some strange stuff in my time, and I'll admit, well, you know what, if I can see that, then I could probably see anything. I can't rule it out that people do have those experiences. Seems to be a lot of evidence to support it. However, you know, when we start to research that phenomenon, it goes back a long, long, long time into ancient times, places all over the world in ancient times, which talk about settlements of these creatures, which talk about that they used to trade with them, that these were half humanoid, half dog headed people. And it gets so much crazy that in the early AD, a guy called Ramanactus, I think his name was, was basically saying, you know, do these creatures have souls? There was debates about it. It's a bit like at parliament level, I suppose, as you can consider that, or congressional level in them days, talking to these people about debating, did they have souls? Not the debate of, are they real? Is it seemingly that they've accepted the fact that these things are real? Or, you know, where did they lie in God's plan? That sort of thing. And that's what was being debated. Throughout Europe, there's plenty of stories and incidents reported i mean we've got incidents taking place in ancient times throughout europe where these things literally scared people to death you know i mean they, they, these things would sometimes manifest in prisons where prisoners were found literally look like they died from from death i can only as it was what's described you know they couldn't find a cause of death but they were dead and it, this thing was apparently witnessed by numerous inmates and people working there apparently closed down these buildings sometimes because of these manifestations of these cryptids that used to terrify the inmates at night and of course they'd hear screaming and all sorts of commotion going on and the guards were very scared and of course what they did is eventually is close down these locations but it's not just that i mean you got places like in the uk kind of chase that's also a place where these things manifest where did this happen? Like, what prisons? Was it the US, UK? Uh, no, I know it was a European case, and I think it was around about the 15 or 1600s, you know, mm -hmm. and you do have some documentation about this. But it, there are no, numerous different other locations which are known for those type of... It's strange because it's seemingly certain locations, geological locations, going to play. Now that we have dogmen, and, it, you know, when you start taking the dogmen phenomenon, which seems to be from ancient times, that in more modern times it got introduced into the myths, legends, storytelling aspect and became the werewolf, though that there isn't really much between them. And hence, you know, that that was born that tradition of stories and films and things like that. But there was one person, Professor Brocken, who spent his life looking for the evidence of lycanthrop lycanthropy. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. 
What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. And he traveled the world. And on one occasion, he found himself, I don't, know if it was in, I don't know if it was Africa or someplace, on the top of a mountain with this tribe, because he'd heard reports that, oh yes, these can like can throw into these strange wolf-type beasts, half man, half wolf. And he observed them, but clearly they thought they were, through, through trances and meditation, suddenly they take on animalistic instincts. But... To the eye, no, they never changed at all and actually ruled out that lycanthropy. There's just there's never been any evidence for lycanthropy. However, it wasn't a wasted trip because he was on high of the mountain and he was above the cloud base. And his first camp was down below, which some people were staying there. It's like the halfway point. We're below the cloud base. So when he was up on the top of the mountain, he walked to the edge of the cliff and saw his own shadow being cast across the top of these clouds. Of course, below... The people that were looking up at the base camp, looking up at the cloud, saw this giant figure appear on the top of the cloud because it stretched out. And this is what became the Brock and Spectre. So it wasn't okay, kind yeah, of a waste of strip. Yeah. yeah. So it was basically, oh, I've discovered, oh, this is, oh, I'll call it the Brock and Spectre. So, and that's why, how that came about to this point of being up there on the top of this mountain looking for evidence of lycanthropy. So, but he's done a lot of research all around the world and the evidence didn't stand for it. However, these incidents were being reported, and I do believe people do have these experiences. Some of them, some of these strange cryptids, do have an internal glowing eyes, not lit or reflected from light sources, but are seen to be glowing. And that's seemingly a bit of a giveaway on some of these things, because you've got the lizard man, you've got the moth man, you've got the owl man, you've got many, many different things that are being seen. And they're a bit like ancient Crimea, the kind of half man, half beast, which draws into question, what were these Crimea type beings? We see them in Sumer, in Egypt, the jackal headed person and many others around the world. It seems to be a very intriguing thing that all these ancients all had some knowledge of these strange beings, whatever they represent. But the evidence towards these dogmen wells is plentiful. There's lots. I mean, Ohio has quite a number of incidents, and there's been incidents where people have been pursued by these things. And these things are like, you know, eight foot tall and about four foot wide. They are massive. And they're designed, I think, they're just designed to cause fear. Because these things you'd expect, okay, well, they're predatory. You know, they would be. And like any, any animal on this planet, you know, when they hunt, they'll try and pick out a weak link and then they'll target that and they're usually relentless until they get what they're after. But, you know, in incidents like this, though, I mean, you've got four people which are heading to a shop, a store, took a shortcut across some disused train tracks and were pursued by this thing. And they all saw this thing. It was massive, hairy. They described it as like a, a wolf-type head. Uh, a body of a man, but hairy, claws, teeth, real nasty. And this thing was huge and scared them to death, basically. And they ran for it. Now, it's not easy because this thing was in hot pursuit. Running across train tracks, I wouldn't advise it to do anybody because it's, you know, it only takes one little slip and you're on the floor. And, and this is exactly what happened. One of their friends, because they were four of them, fell to the floor. <laughs> what did they do? They kept on running. So, oh, no, leave him. You know, we, we're just, let's get the hell out of here. But at some point, they thought, oh, oh, my God, you know, our friend, what's happening to our friend? Well, what happened was this thing, which was pursuing, got up to this guy. It was like literally falling on the floor. 
And he did. This guy, he kind of froze in fear. It's like that old instinctual rabbits in the head like situation. If I don't move, they don't see me. It's an old instinctual thing that it doesn't work, of course, with predators. Of course, he, you know, this thing, you, you expect in a predator and it's got its meal ticket there, lying on the floor, not moving, not running away, not trying to escape. You think, okay, well, you know, any predator to finish the, finish the action, but no, they never do. He was like, oh, uh, and this thing's like, well, okay, you know, well, what do I do now? Uh, and then it kind of just kind of runs away. It's like the whole process is to generate fear and terror and not the action of a predator, which is so profound. The only way I can describe it is because it, it does seem to be that, well, if this, these things are about fear... To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email thrillglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. Then what are they doing? Are they feeding from free? Are they utilizing fear pheromones? Are they utilizing the vexation that is generated from these huge amounts of stress and stuff from these incidents? And it started to be dawning on me that, well, really, it's like a physicality of a poltergeist, really, because poltergeist is all about the fear. It's a vexation cycle. It generates actions on purpose for you to witness as no doubt paranormal, to generate fear and vexation, and it utilizes that to create the next event. And it's a vicious cycle. It can go on for quite some time. They're parasitic, you know, they're fear feeders. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting because these seemingly are doing the same thing in a physical sense. You know, it's not about being a predatory actions. It's about fear and terror. You know, and then there was other incidents that I looked at. Two teenagers, they've stayed with the father for a few weeks in a log cabin, in a remote location out in Forestland in the US. Can't remember exactly the location. It might be in Kentucky where I'm not too sure, but they saw this thing. And this is around about sort of just about before the sun had set, but they saw this thing and this thing was terrified terrified them it was this was large again hairy dog-headed teeth claws clearly visible this thing was pursuing them and they got to the log cabin they slammed the door shut and locked it this thing is outside the door and you know i mean if you wanted to get in there's a big window there next to it it could have just jumped straight through the window if we really wanted to but no that's too easy what it's doing is it wants to generate fear and terror. So it's got all of the handle of the cabin door. And it's doing like what we would do if you wanted to scare children. It's got all of it and it's going, ah, so I think, you know, it's all about the fear, remember? These two teenagers, female and the male, screaming their heads off. Now, because they made such a ruckus, the father, who was asleep upstairs, because he'd been working, he got up. I thought, what the hell is all this noise? And of course, he's a no-nonsense guy, Sean. He's like, I don't take any of this BS. You know, what's going on? What's all this noise? And he comes down in an angrily mood, woke up from his sleep, to hear them screaming, don't open the door, Dad, don't open the door. And of course, oh, it's none of this nonsense. And he unlocks the door and he throws it open. This thing's just, it's there. It's literally, he, he, he stands there and he's just froze he's looking in the eyes of this thing which is literally a foot away from him and it's towering over him and he's looking at it and he's thinking he, he, god knows what's thing he's just like i'm froze what the hell and then this thing is kind of just runs off it's like game <laughs> over and he do, he's like what the hell was you know and they report this incident and it's not the first time these incidents have happened where it's seemingly associated to fear and stress vexation you know the terror as opposed to many acts. And it started to get me thinking about what's actually going on here. I mean, are they feeding on fear? I mean, did he smell fear? I mean, let's look at the research on that. So we looked into the research on this. And there's been a lot of debate over the years about some scientists say, oh, yes, we still generate fear pheromones and we can, some people can pick up on them sort of thing. It's an old instinctual thing, you know, from survival sense days. And some scientists say, oh, no, no, that's an old trait. It's long forgotten now. We don't have that anymore. Well, I looked at some of the research, and the research points to, yes, we do. I mean, there were some tests that were carried out, and these tests were carried out on four skydivers, 
for the first time, these four guys were going skydiving mm-hmm. and they fastened these sweat band things to them and they would like pads to gather any perspiration from them during this jumping out of an airplane. And also, there was these same patterns were applied to just four women, which get together now and again and go running through the park. So they came, the results were taken from them, these patches, and brought to the laboratory. And they were tested regarding scent put through this special machine. And you, you have to sit there and you have to kind of put this thing over your nose, know, smell and see if you could. Through the process of that, they were managed to be, I pick out the people time and time again that were demonstrating that they had stress and these are the skydivers not the runners and i thought okay well there's some evidence to point to yes we still generate pheromones yes some people can still experience the scent of those fear pheromones is this what it's about are they fear feeding are they feeding on the pheromones from us or is this something else at play here what is it why does it want to gather Unless it's energy, it's something to do with energy. It's the vexation, the stress. And we generate so much energy through adrenaline release and cortisol. Is it gathering some type of energy and being utilized like a poltergeist later on? So it's really strange and we couldn't really hammer it down. But then what we started to do is looking through history, we realized that we got directly involved in Babylonian demonology. And the reason why is because Babylonian demons are dog-headed people. There's all little statuettes of them and carvings and things as, you know, and they, they were always represented as beings with dog heads. And these were referred to as demons or, you know, Sumerian type demons or Babylonian demons. Utilizing that information, because when we started to do that research, we didn't realize, I mean, most of the time we just go about our research, not our problem. But when we started getting into this Babylonian demonology, these dogmen stuff, Myself and Barry were working on this. And Barry lives in Ireland and I'm in the UK. So we're not close. And that evening, I can only describe it as that all hell broke loose. But for, for me, it was around about five o'clock in the evening. We'd finished our research for the day, myself and Barry, and just kind of going back about our businesses at home. He's in Ireland, I'm in the UK, like I said. And I'd had dinner and like I sometimes do, I get that notion to just go out. I need to go outside. So I did. I went outside the back door and into my garden. And there it was. There was a craft in the sky. You know, and that's not the first time that's happened to me. I kind of get that little, I don't know, the nod from it, the phenomenon, or some feeling that's around. And I I usually react to it. And I did. And I saw it. And I watched it. And I took photos and stuff, you know. And uh, and it didn't move away. And and I got fed up. I went in. Do you have have photos of it? Oh, I got photos of it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And um, you shared them? Oh, God, yeah, I've got loads of photographs. I see these things all the time. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of them. So I've got them on video and they play over and stuff. It's just, that's just my life. It's just the way it's been, you know. And not just for me, for Barry as well. And uh, I kind of just went in. I kind of, I don't know why. I just thought, well, after 10, 15 minutes, I'm like saying, well, okay, guys, what do you want? What, what, What do you want? And I got nothing in return, so I thought, shut the door, came in. About two, almost about two, three, about maybe about, I think it was about five to three in the morning or something like that. So then I woke up, it's about three o'clock. And I needed to go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom and came back in. And I just climbed into bed and I was just trying to get, okay, get that comfortable position again. When a hand came up from, through the mattress underneath me and grabbed round me from another hand came up from behind and grabbed round me and I was in a tight grasp. It was definitely male because it wasn't a creature, it was a male because I could feel stubble on my shoulder because it was like this sort of thing, I could feel stubble on my shoulder. Well, do you know what? I kicked out and I played hell and I battled with this thing to get off it, get off me. Eventually it let go and gone. Of course, I'm up. That was it. I'm up. You know, I, you know, it's unsettled me. I don't like those sort of things. If you've got a problem, let's have it out sort of thing. And, you know, off it went. 
And I stayed up until it was morning and I decided to contact Barry to let Barry know what's happened, what sort of, what, wow, what a night I've had. And before I could even tell him, he was like saying to me, before you say anything, Steve, all hell broke loose here last night. No, he ripped his light fittings out of the kitchen this thing, you know. And I thought, all right, okay, all right. So we realised, we identified these things through our research. We got a slap on the hand. Whatever we were doing that day, he didn't like. He didn't like us prying into the Sumerian demonological side of stuff and trying to work stuff out. But like I've said before, Sean, is that they're not very good in reverse psychology. You know, it's like, they don't think, oh, you know, ignore them because they won't have a clue if that's the right path. No. Their actions speak louder than words, and they, it's for us, it's like, well, you've just fueled the fire. You, we know we're on the right path because they don't think, you know, or they don't, just don't think like that. So, of course, we realised, myself and Barry, okay, with the work that we were doing, all right, yeah, we have to continue this work, but now we have to write in a respite protocol so we don't catch the eye of the phenomena so much. And we don't if you do it in bits and bobs. You know, two times a week, two times out of five days, three times out of seven. It's got to be. What were you doing that precipitated this particular reaction? Well, because of the Project Doorway and the research that we're involved in, we started getting into invocation, incantation stuff in regarding non-human intelligences, which goes back a long, long, long time. And it's been utilized by the highest authorities and establishments and organizations on the planet, involving communications with NHI to get tech, advanced tech from them, or advancements to get into space and all sorts of different things. And it's been rewarding to them on some occasions. You don't always get the full picture, but it's rewarding. And we realized, okay, well, we've caught the eye. They don't like it. So we're going to have to write in a respite protocol. So we did. I wrote a respite protocol, basically, you know, the two out of five or three out of seven, we call it. It's, you know, you come to do the studies. Don't get me wrong. It is exciting, sure, when things happen. And that's the problem because we want to do it more and more and more. When we do, you know, what we're not realizing is when it's putting on a great show is it's getting under our skin. And when it does that, then it becomes the hitchhiker type stuff. It follows you back home and starts playing up and disturbances and stuff. And it's, it could be a real pain in the backside. And there have been some times when doing that. So we don't want those issues because of the research. So we don't want it to catch the eye so much. So we respite those things. You know, we give a protocol to make sure we're putting a lengthy enough gap between so they don't see that we're at it all the time. Yeah, it just takes longer to get there, research. And, and I think because of what we were involved in, because the incantation stuff went back to Alistair Crowley, you know, he actually goes back before Alistair Crowley, actually from Germany, really, um, before Alistair Crowley, who started taking it on board and adapting it, his own methodology to it. And Jack Parsons as well. I mean, Jack Parsons did exactly the same thing. He was using Babylonian invocation, a bit like some of the stuff that we've been researching. And he went from normal sittings to poltergeist disturbances, which is like your first layer of things to push through. He pushed through and managed to communicate with NHI. But they always they wanted something in return back then for Parsons, because Parsons was working alongside Ron Hubbard, who was his scribe, in his apartment. And they told him directly, well, you need to go to this geological location, direct location, a geological location. And what do we want in return? Well, we want some of your blood. So he actually took some of his own blood and gave it as an offering in this location, which was in a specific location in the middle of the Mojave Desert, of all places, which he you know went. Where that place is? is I that do. Place? Is yeah. it widely communicated or is it kind of a secret? It's not widely communicated, no. But it's not the first time people have been instructed to go there. You know, um, George Van Tassel went there. I mean, in fact... A few people did and were associated with Giant Rock, which is in the, in the Mojave Desert. And, the, and there was nothing about UFO seen around that location. The, the entities came out of the rock, and that's where the original story comes from. So Van Tassel was communicating with NHI in that location and numerous other people which went there. So the process of that, they wanted something in between, yeah, and it usually is. But it's the same process which people have been doing for a long, long time. And there are certain different types of methodology of invocation, but 
the quickest route is through your Enochian Babylonian methodology, but it's risky. And I wouldn't advise anybody do that. Because sometimes, you know, it doesn't always go to plan. Um, and sometimes it just annoys them. But sometimes you can get a direct path through very quickly without having to put the time and effort in of building your specific circle. Your specific circle, the, the better methodology is through the sales process. But your first four months is about picking the right people. But with any proper sales, it's, you don't just come to the table. It, everybody has to be linked. It can't be no weak links. It has to be. It's very attuned, that circle. So you pick your four people or five, if you're sitting yourself and making up six. It should be seven, you know, or 12, which is supposed to be for the Enochian practice anyway, or invocation for it's like a coven type stuff, you know. And you have to test it. And you work out over a period of four months by swapping people around, which one has been the most successful in communications. And that is when you know, okay, you've attuned the circle. Once you've done that, then you plow into that and you're regularly doing that until you end up building what is referred to as a conduit. The good thing about building a conduit, you know, and some people will never get to that point. But if you, if you build conduit, What's interesting is when you go away from the table and you come back, the conduit's open. It's, you don't have to do it all again. It's like that. It's just like it's on, you know, this is on speed dial. <laughs> you know, you, you pick up exactly where you left off to the point where you're communicating with NHI or non human intelligences. And if you're lucky enough, like some of our experiments, you can ask questions and you can gain answers. However, we are aware that there's a deceptive nature to this phenomena. And it isn't always truthful. Sometimes they are absolutely truthful. Mm. Uh, they've demonstrated that they know about future events, which they've told us on several occasions and which have all come to pass. So that's led us into doing research and debating and talking about the subject of predestinational um, events and free will. And do we really have it? Or is it a, is a phenomena which has godly power, in a sense of speaking, which they do, seemingly cause multiple serendipity or coincidences or incidents unfolding. Could be thousands of events to lead to the predestination. So they're manipulating event over event over event over event to get there. Mm -hmm. Or they know that it's already going to happen sometime further along the path and they're aware of that. When we started realizing that the evidence was quite high towards, okay, well, they know about future events, NHI. So that led us into research as what is referred to as the initiation experience. Now, this is when it applies to the numerous different ways that people have contact experiences. One of them is the initiation experience. Usually it happens between the ages of five and seven, and they're initiated by the phenomena. And then sometime later on in their life, they might not know that at the time when you're sort of discussing this with them, the event might not have come to be. Why the reason for the initiation experience? But some of the people that I've talked to, and I will tell you that there are people in the highest positions of researchers, speakers, lecturers, world-renowned people, which have lectured alongside, which have had these personal experiences, but they don't say because they don't want to be biased regarding their conclusive or research information. And I get that because, you know, what, I could plenty of time I could have gone up on stage and would have talked to lectured all over the world and said, look, I'm Steve now and I'm an experiencer. Yeah, I had my first experiences when I was seven. When I researched it, I found out through certain people, they said those, these incidents stopped when they reached teenagers, 17, round about. Mine was plowed right through it. I'm still an experiencer today than I, had, than I was when I was seven. There's no let up in regarding just the all encompassing. It came knocking on my door, Sean. I didn't go knocking on it. And the thing is, did it know when I had that initiation experience that in years to come that I'm going to be lecturing to thousands of people, that I'll be writing books and passing their word on. I'm doing their job for them because this phenomenon likes a flock. And I'm not going to say it's a religion, <coughs> but it acts like it. And how it acts like it is that I've had come across so many people that said, I've never had an experience, you know, and I've been there and I've tried this and I've never seen a thing. But when you actually ask some questions, you don't believe in it. You know, this just like, oh, I don't believe in that nonsense. 
And yeah, why aren't I have experiences? Because you don't believe it. Because that this phenomenon acts a bit like a religion where faith apparitions, you're not going to see a faith apparition, anything associated to biblical reference, unless you have a belief in religion. You know, so you kind of that has to be the predecessor. This is what this phenomenon does. I mean, you've got many penny people all over the world. I mean, recently you've got Gary Nolan. Now, Gary Nolan, who's a, a well-known researcher from, what's the place called? Where did they do remote viewing uh, research? Stanford. Stanford Research. Yeah. He came into this subject quite sceptical, but when he started researching and doing the work in regarding the ufological stuff, I was interested to find a, a video on YouTube in which he's stating that he started to have some experiences. And I thought, well, isn't that just as it is you know you become interested might switch your belief system somewhat and hey presto phenomena realizes this and delivers something because you're doing a good job for us because you're a guy who will speak to hundreds if not thousands of people who will hear you and you'll pass the message on because this phenomenon likes its clock always has done and there's a good researcher out there called paul wallace He's wrote a few books, and he's done the same research like we've done, and he's sort of been very vocal at the moment about how the word God, or these biblical references, have been hijacked and by the church to represent phenomena in many cases. You've got Professor Diana Pusalka, who everybody's dream to go to the Vatican archive. I mean, the Vatican is not a church, not a temple of any sort. It's a library. It's like the old ancient Alexander Library. 53 miles of libraries under there. Vatican's tiny compared to what's underneath that. 53 miles. And do you know what? I don't know how, but she got access for three days, as far as I'm aware, it was three days, on it unattended. I was like, oh my God, that's my dream come true. And what would I do? Well, she did exactly what I would do. She went to the source material just like I would. I'd look at Francis of Assisi. You know, oh, well, you, you know, the, you, you met with this godly power and it shone a, a light down on upon him and the Christ wounds appeared on him and this, that, and the other. Source information, no, he saw something strange in the sky, it interacted with him, he put his hands up when a beam of light came down and it actually burned his hands and he was hospitalized from bad, really bad burns. Of course, that became the wounds of Christ, and it had to be all godly and spiritual. And interesting, what they don't tell you is that he went on to create one of the first flying saucer cults ever. You know, what they won't tell you that. And it's the same for Theresa Vale. I mean, that was a horrific experience she documented in a day. This is a nun, you know, and it's kind of been sainted. Yeah, and you think, well, how do you get to the story in the Bible that? A cherub appeared and talked to her and this, that, and the other. It was a very godly spiritual experience. No, the source material was horrific, what she wrote down. This creature, she's about three foot tall, appeared in a room at night, like they do, with an instrument in its hand. And as she described it, this is how she described it, quote, it thrusted it up my entrails, unquote. Not a pleasant experience. And what happens then is that he goes on to conduct some type of examination. It was horrific for her. She was completely manipulated by the phenomenon. No different than a part of a story in the abduction book that John Matt wrote, or the ones that Bud Hawkins wrote. No different, exactly the same. The church took it and made that creature into a cherub. And that creature was holding that instrument, whatever that thing was, that thrusted up her, it's not nice, was became Cherub's Dart or Cupid's Arrow. The church then started representing it as Cupid or Cherub's. Then later on, in reference to statues and artwork of Theresa of Vale, they changed the Cherub or the Cupid's to the Dove Partridge. The Dove Partridge represents the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit in. Now you have to question everything, right down to the source information. When we're seeing references of strange things in the sky that look oval on and these ancient paintings, and he's got a little picture of a little dove or partridge in the center of it, 
you know, and this beam of light coming down with the double partridge in it. We have to question, has God been hijacked? The reference in the biblical reference to angels, cupids, are oh, Mary. You know, it's crazy. The, the most religious location on the planet is Lourdes. You know, millions of people visit it every year. Some say they get cured, you know. Well, I think that is a wonderful thing, placebos. I think, yes, we know there's evidence of that. Yeah, it works, you know. We know it works. You only have to take just one or two accounts to show it absolutely does. So we're going to hear about those amazing, miraculous healings. They're called faith healings, the same thing. It's, we do it to ourselves. You know, we can do the opposite. We can cause wounds to appear. The Christ wounds, the stigmata in parapsychological circles, is called SISPM, self-induced spontaneous physical marking. We know how it works. We did tests with putting people under hypnosis and putting a, a coin on their arm and saying the coin was hot and watched the skin blister. The mind, the, the physiological, is governed by the psychological. And that's why we have the Christ wounds. If you believe something strong enough, they can appear. So we realize very quickly that the whole referencing to these, whatever these things are, angels and all these sort of things, maybe they just weren't. There was something else, but the church has kind of twisted it. And that was, and of course, they're not happy with, you can imagine, and with Professor Diana Pasolka, caused a lot of people, after she wrote this into a book, American Cosmic, which is a brilliant book, of course, a lot of people started writing the Vatican. And what have they done? For the first time, they've sealed the lips. No comment. No comment. They're furious. They're furious. Didn't realize she was going to go and look at the source information and go public. And don't think she'll get invited back anytime soon. But this is what myself and Bob have been saying for a long time. Eight years ago, we said the terminology regarding extraterrestrials or the extraterrestrial hypothesis is going to go, is going to get replaced because it will be replaced by introducing us to the new narrative. Because the old narrative has not been truthful. And the new narrative is referencing NHI, non-human intelligences, because that's what they are. There's, there's not enough evidence to support that they're extraterrestrial. Leslie Keane, good researcher, author, well-known in the subject of ufology and near-death experiences and the paranormal now, she spent quite some time in the UK last year involved in a number of experiments which i'm aware of i know some of the people that are involved in those experiments Stuart kind of like alexander and physical mediumship that's what it's yeah doing. she was involved in those circles and she experienced what we've experienced you know we've, we've experienced the materializations we've experienced the the demonstrations of metaphysical phenomena all sorts of things for her she, the penny dropped and then she went public around about summertime last year to say UFOs, and this is on the two big leading newspapers. I think it was the New York Post and the Washington, no, Washington, Washington Post, New York Times, which she's got connections with, which would never have normally touched this subject prior to the Pentagon stuff, but that was kind of it was a kind of a plan to do that together. And that's a different story. <laughs> we'll get to that maybe up sometime. But she realized, okay, she's been picked. They have to pick the people who've got the, the biggest outreach to change the narrative. Well, she's the first. She goes out there, UFOs, they consist of something supernatural, paranormal, the evidence of all time. September comes, NASA do their report, and NASA came, concluded, after doing a study into the subject of the UAP, or UFO, I wonder what to call it now. You want to call it UAP so they can sweep the last 70 years of the wrong narrative under the carpet, which you'll get that. Then... They said, well, you know, kind of, we know people see UFOs, you know, they documented the film by the military, da 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 da, and different people, police, on, you know, we see the infrared footage. And the conclusion was there's not enough to support that they are extraterrestrial in origin. Well, surprise, surprise, that's not a, because you go back to 1977, you've got J. Allen Hynek, who worked on Project Blue Ball. Now, we all know that from the ufology, J. Allen Hynek is. But in 1977, when he was winding it down, he had a specialised meeting and came to this meeting and he said, and this is remarkable actually, that 
there was not enough evidence to support that these were extraterrestrial. That was 1977. They've known a long time that this is the case, but that's the ruse. It's the narrative they want you to believe and what, what people have swallowed for the last 70 or even longer years. But also, it was, it was referenced at that time, Project Blue Book had over 12 million variations of the UFO phenomena. 12 million. And that falls directly in line because he got shunned, of course, for saying that. So much so, he went to work with Jacques Vallée for three years. But Jacques Vallée was very, very vocal. And he said, this phenomenon represents absurdity on purpose. This is why you've got your 12 million variations. There is no base model. There's no base model for the crafts. There's no base model for the entities. Be what they want or choose what they want to be. They like to go with what's in the public domain, of course. Well, look where we are now. For the first time in history, we have the internet and television and radio. So much so. And we didn't have the internet back in the 1950s when the Space Brothers were around. Where's all the Space Brothers gone? You know, but now the alien greys are here. And it's here to stay for a while. Well, why is it so here? I mean, I think it will change its face eventually, the phenomena, but mm. why are they here so long? Because it's in our mindset every single day, because it's been now highly distributed across the internet, TV, movies, the media, you name it. You can't get away from that damn grey alien face and the black eyes. And that's exactly what they'll adopt until, you know, in time it isn't, you know, when things start to change or maybe when we learn a new narrative a bit better. And then after that, Arrow come out, which is the Pentagon's UFO program, Arrow, only about four weeks ago. And what did they conclude? Surprise, surprise. Mm, not enough evidence to support that they're extraterrestrial. They're telling us we are now living at a time, and it's very exciting because we've been there for the last 10 years, myself and Barry. What's happening is why our work has been so illuminated now is simply because the narrative is changing. And they realise when it comes over, oh, hang on, it's already been occupied, this area, by Project Doorway, Stephen Barry's work. It's illuminating, that's why. The whole idea is just to start changing that narrative. And it's exciting, we're living that moment, and we're shifting away from that to something else, that these things are more likely interdimensional. Mm -hmm. And the, the hypothesis of extraterrestrials travelling the vast distances of space to come to planet Earth is not the case. They've always been here. This is not a new phenomenon. It's just been here forever, forever guising itself. You, you, you have to track the phenomena like my colleague Barry does. He, he tracks the phenomena, not the mask, because the mask is forever changing. In different countries, it's the same phenomenon is represented in different ways. You take Ireland, you'll, you'll say the fae. You know, all the fairy folk, the missing time, the ones that abduct people, the ones that take animals from farms, and so, the fae. It's the same thing. It's just... Same phenomena, just a different mask. It fits in with culture and your upbringing and what your beliefs are, and the mythologies and stuff. So they're going to vary around the planet. So you just scrap all that aside. Don't look at that. Just look at the phenomenon. And that reveals, oh, yeah, same phenomena, always. And it goes back in ancient times. So it goes full circle. So we think, you know, with your opening question regarding the dogman and things like that, they're in close association with that phenomenon because... There are so many incidents associated with UFOs. There's the unusual and pleasant smells of sulfur in association with them. Again, is as featured in ufological cases and the smell of ammonia and sulfur type stuff, Virginia case and many other ones. And you've also got that smelling demonological stuff, the paranormal stuff, the cryptid stuff. You know, you, there's key factors when you look and it interconnects these things a lot that we're dealing with a source that's seemingly presenting itself in many, many different ways to interact with us in many, many different ways. But at the end of the day, they seem to have, I can only say it's like godly power. If anybody else was to witness this phenomenon first time, they'd think it's God. They would, if the ancient times, they think, oh, this right. is the deity. You know, when you look around at these deities, I mean, it's three million deities in India. Three million of the damn things. There's holy caves all over the world where people have seen not humans, non-human intelligences, these strange deities that don't look human, and they're thought to be gods. And what did they do? They'd go and worship them, and they still worship. Today, thousands of people travel to these holy caves to worship these beings. I always question, what are we worshipping? You know, What are we praying to? What is the Holy Spirit? I mean, don't get me wrong. People say, oh, Steve, you're not religious. Well, yeah, I am, but religion lies in here. 
you know, it's not an external thing that can be manipulated. Because you only got to look at Christianity to realize, hmm, God had his bad days in the Old Testament. He liked to smite people. Sometimes he said, kill your son, offering to me, blood sacrifice. Yeah. Is that not the yeah. same as the Inca and the Aztecs and the Mayans? You know, it's the same the same thing. Just forget the face, the mask. It's the same thing. It's not good. And when we look at that and we think, well, okay, we'll pray to this. But when you look at a Christian religion, it's like, well, hang on, it's Sumerian, it's Egyptian, you know, it's Amun. Not the end, not our men, it's our moon, it's, it's his Egyptian god. <laughs> you know, there's references of, of, of Babylonian, of Sumerian, and also Egyptian in there. It's a mix of all things. Those crucifixions didn't come from the Christian Bible. It was happening in Sumerian times. We've got the references to it. They've got the artwork, the drawings, the sculptures that have been discovered showing the crucifixion of people. The onk in Egyptian time is the same as the cross of the Christian cross, the crucifix. You know, it's disguised religion, and not just ours, you know, our Christian, it's, it's all over the world. And we're the problem, because we put into terminologies, we said, oh, well, it, let's call it this, and let it be considered to be looked like this. And that's the problem, you know. <laughs> but when you cancel all that out and look at it all it's all the same thing all over the world so something at godly level has been interacting with humankind right from the beginning of days in fact it might predate even documented history to be honest with you mm -hmm. so where are we to say they're extraterrestrial they might pre-exist us on this planet <laughs> maybe we're new kids on the block who knows Stuart? i mean the thing is sean is not enough people are asking the questions they're taking the right. narrative of all this baloney over the years the hierarchy i mean i've talked with these some of these guys well they'd say ufos don't crash they don't burn up they don't have blow up in the sky they don't parts don't drop off them they call them gifts they call them gathering fields this is the phenomena it's producing and it sacrifices it sacrifices technology it sacrifices biologics to advance humankind it's been doing that for a long long time and it's the same with our space program. We would never be in space if it wasn't for an HI. They're the ones that helped us get there by downloaded information or ritualistic practices that the hierarchy of jet propulsion laboratories, not just JPL, but many others around the world, have all been invoked into these in communications and they got us to the stars. This is why you don't realize, and many people don't, that they're paying homage all the time about getting into space. This is why when he went to the moon, the first flag wasn't the American flag, it was a Masonic flag. This is why they did a Masonic ritual there on the moon. It's all about paying homage. Thank you for getting us to the stars. They're advancing us quickly in technology. Unfortunately, might not be advancing very much spirituality-wise. We need to catch up a little bit, I think, on that. But it seems to be their doing, and sometimes they've even manipulated history. You can see that through ancient biblical documentation, like Alexander the Great, you know, as a perfect example. He assisted with bringing down some walls, which are like the walls of Jericho, you know, that shot these beams of light, these flying discs came down, which scared the war elephants, shot these beams of light at this wall, and managing, allowing him to besiege the city. So they've assisted him. And, but in the Bible and everything, oh, Alexander worked with God. You know, he was godly and represented by the horns, you know, higher than the halo, like Moses, the Moses horns. You look for Moses, you'll find him stained glass windows and sculptures and statues and paintings with horns. It's a representation of higher than the halo, in a sense of speaking, that he worked solely for God. Well, who was God, you know, and what are the flaming shields that assisted him? There are lots of, there are hundreds of cases like that documented. So we know that they've, altered history to some point you know or assisted in certain things they are the watchers we are the project we are the experiment they culture us they experiment with us they modify us they, you know genetically you know alter us maybe in some cases because humans have been a project of tampered species for a long long, long time and, and it's still happening today in current times you know still things are happening so we have to question what's responsible at the end of the day. Well, who knows? We put all this into AI computer, which has been done. It's called a CRS system for three years. 
it comes out with every, all the details, every feasible thing in a subject you can think of was fed into this computer. Every subject, every sub-subject, you name it. It comes out with two paragraphs, irrespective of reams of information. Oh, two paragraphs. First one, there's so much connectivity between all phenomena, it believes it's one source. Second thing, whatever the source is, it's, it's, in, it's in seemingly has the capabilities of creating physiological constructs. Well, it's me, you, this chair, table, all physiological constructs when we want to be, because it can be metaphysical in nature. One minute it's real. Sometimes UFOs are seen, but people, the problem is we naturally think, oh, with our physics, it's real, it's there. No, you know, they can skirt our reality. We can see them, but they don't interfere or interact with it. This is allowing them to go into the ground, into volcanoes, into hillsides, mm. go into water without any wakes, go past aircraft without any sonic booms or wakes being felt because the skirt in our reality they can switch between physicality and non-physicality they can disappear in the blink of an eye and just collapse within themselves or come through from somewhere else go about their business you know there's no controlling that when they have the real phenomena the thing is though is that when people are filming these you're thinking oh it's like filming an aircraft and that aircraft has got this is being hit by the physicalities of the, of the physics that we know in our environment you know, all those inertias and G-forces and gravity and force of wind and all these different things, pressure, whatever, doesn't apply. You know, it's, it's like you're outside of that sometimes. And that is no different than the metaphysical apparitions or manifestations that appear in some of the experiments or in parapsychological circles when they're told, you know, there's a vase on the table and they're told, you know, they see the vase slightly move and they say, reach out grab the bars, put it back. So you reach out, pick the bars up and put it back. And then they do it again. And you reach out and put the bars back. And then they say, do it again. So it moves across the table. You go to reach out and your hand goes right through it. You can't pick the damn thing up. And yet you're looking at it absolutely stumped, thinking, I can see it in there. It's physical looking in nature. But once I put my hand out to it, there's nothing. The hand goes right through the damn thing. Until they turn around and say, okay, no, try it again. And you do it, and it's physical again. These are incidents have happened, examples that they want to prove that they have metaphysical properties. Balls of light with mass to them. You can feel them. You can hold them in your hand with light come out from your hands. You can feel weight to them. Comes out, it bounces on the table three times, then goes through it, then up, then through it again then up and then bounces on the table these are demonstrations done on purpose to say hey guys we are metaphysical phenomena we can choose to be physical in your reality or choose not to be you might see us but we're not physical don't we get that in the paranormal all the time yes do we not get that in this ufological stuff yes the ufos and the entities oh they were physical and they, they picked up something and yet they walked right through the wall you know it's metaphysical phenomena one of the two things, no wonder the computers are turning around and saying, it's all the same source, what's going on? And confusing the hell out of this is the best AI stuff in the world to put to test to it. Jacques Vallée tried it in the 1960s with some of the AI stuff, but he just couldn't, he wasn't good enough. But he's always confirmed, you know, this is what this phenomenon represents. This represents absurdity on purpose. Sometimes you get it wrong. Craft comes down, you think, wow, look at the technology, this strange looking craft. Leaves markings on the ground. Why has he got 1930s portholes around the size of rivets? Right. You know, not quite right. got it right because the masters of our deception are, and altering and manipulating our own perception, they're masters at manipulating humans. That's the main thing, you see, and our environment, you know, and our reality. You can imagine that this bombshell can't be dropped in at any disclosure program. That's why we know they can go forever at these places in congressional hearings. They're never going to give us that. They'll just give us little trimmings and it will incite people. And of course, it's interesting that over the last 18 months, the amount of UFOs that have been talked about in the US is incredible. It's been on every media outlet. It's in every newspaper. It's been all over the damn place in TV shows and reports. And isn't it interesting that the amount of sightings from people have just rocketed over the last 18 months in America? Why? It's because it's changing the belief system of, of people. And when you start mm -hmm. to change the belief system, they start to become experiencers. 
just like the same like a religion in a sense of speaking what do you think the intent of these or this intelligence intelligences is what do i think they are well or the intent what their intent or is. the intent well the intent is clearly is that we're we're the focus point <laughs> you know they're all, they're all very great one-liners i love those one-liners that they come out with oh if you see a human let's give them the one-liner oh, oh, oh we're here to save planet earth or oh, oh we're here for you know we, to, for save humanity you know and Mm -hmm. absolute bs you know i mean this is the deception at its best why come and land at a school then and tell kids they do it all the time they're landing at schools and telling six and seven year olds oh you got to save the world you know, let me tell you about the economy what utter rubbish do you think these guys are stupid no they're not stupid but they don't know what to say it's the old one liner and the fact is is that are they happy i mean are, are they going to do something for us well is it planet earth well, unfortunately, the realism of it, and it's a hard thing to swallow, you know, it's a bitter pill, that we've already gone past the point of saving planet Earth. I know from the research in this that if you press the button today, it's not going to stop for another 25 years. It's a rolling stop. It's going to take 25 years. We're already past the point. We've tipped the scales too far, and they're not going to let up. And this is why they're spending trillions secretly the US government in looking for new planet Earth and saving old planet Earth. You know, and so where's the aliens in? Where's these guys? Where are they these NHIs? What have they done to stop us? Zip. You know, nothing. What have they done to deter us? Have they give us certain things that we don't put it out so much into the public domain by their use, by their doing, that it can't be ignored. It's in the public domain and that is going to change the lives of everything to save planet Earth. No. They've done nothing. Okay, so is it humanity then? They must care about us then. Well, no. I mean, look at the wars. Did he stop him? Did he intervene? No. The pointless millions of people get killed every single year under what? Greed, thinking that we own the land when we only adopted it. You know, or, or the fact is it's down to religion. You know, or, you know, we've not come far from the caveman days. Whoever's got the biggest stick wins. And they've still got that stupid mentality. And unfortunately, there's many a time I want to just sit there in the morning and think, I really do want to disassociate myself with humanity. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. And yet, I'm part of the problem. You know, it's a, society's made it that way. And it's a problem that is going to just suck everything out of planet Earth until we move on like a virus to another planet and reap its rewards. You know, we've got to get past this problem. But it doesn't seem that these non-human intelligences care about us or care about much about planets, to be honest with you. You know, but they are intrigued about our development and they are intrigued in giving us technology to push us forward. But where are we going to be? And what frightens me is that the technology comes before common sense here, that we haven't grown spiritually or consciously enough to even wield this technology like kids with matches. That's dangerous because you're going to send us out into space you're sending us out armed to the teeth. We all watch these horror films, don't we? Like Alien, you know, and things like that. We're the bad guys. I guarantee it. We are the ones that they're probably thinking, oh my God, well, bad we, you know, because we kill ourselves. I mean, what other species does that really, to be honest with you? Not many, you know. With a, yeah, that, not many though, considering right. we're quite happy to press a button and kill millions of them. You know, it's just... It's inhumane. And you think, wow, you want to release us out there? You know, so you have to question what's steering us and what's its intentions. I don't know. It's a really good question. But what I can say is, it seems like we're in a petri dish and we've been in an experiment for a long, long, long time. And I think sometimes it's, they might even, you know, they might wipe the slate clean sometimes and say, oh, do you know what? It's not going the way we want. Let's wipe the slate clean and rebirth it, making sure that only 65,000 people on a human survive a catastrophe just enough to rebirth population do that a few times and we, we were it was as graham hancock say we're a species of amnesia is there a chance that this phenomenon is us some higher dimension of us or we live in a world where we manifest reality in a certain extent so the more you believe in this stuff the more it shows up well, you know, I'll come across the hypothesis that, you know, insults from the future, that sort of thing. However, I think if that is the case, then the first thing is, is that, 
you know, you would consider trying to rectify problems of what's going to lead to problems in the future for them to have to come back to resolve in the first place. You know, but I'm not seeing those vast changes. It sounds to me, because somebody, I've had that argument loads of times, oh, well, the greys used to be us, you know, the grey now, because obviously the UVs change so much that their skin's turn grey. They become so intelligent, they don't need to use muscles to move things around. You can tele- telepathically move things or, you know, psychokinetically. So they become very weak and withered. They have large eyes because they live in an environment that, oh, well, the sun's not what it used to be and this, that, and the other. Do you know what? I've heard all this sort of stuff. The problem for me is, is that there's multiple of these things. Where would the small hairy creatures come into it? The robotic ones, the, the lizard people, you know, and I can list goes on for thousands and thousands of these things. Well, okay, well, are they all those or? It doesn't make any sense. It sounds like the to me this this phenomena, whatever this source is, when it steps into our reality, kind of works out. Okay, am I going to step into the stereotypical mold for the twenty first century, which is the grey? Yeah, I might do. On other times, no, I might not. I might be this. I might be that. I might do things, and I'll gather my information and do my agenda in my own way. Sometimes it's not good, and those incidents get swept under the carpet. Because there are people that say, oh, it's all love and light, it's love and light. And then you take them for hypnosis and you find out, hang on a second, it wasn't. They realised that under hypnosis, it was a programmed memory, you know. Mm-hmm. But they only got to do is say, oh, it's all love and light from a programmed memory and go and speak to some person who writes books on the love and light aspects of this. And a book is out and 10, 20,000 people read that book. And they're convinced, oh, it's all love and light. You see, they're very deceptive. You know, and they manipulate us. We are so slower than children. We, you know, we're so easily manipulated. It's like the process of paralysis. We get that through the paranormal aspects of, oh, a dark figure appeared up in the bedroom one night. I woke up and I couldn't move. Paralysis set in. All these three grey aliens entities sat around my bed. You know, there's a light coming through the window, and I woke up and there they were, and I can't move. It's paralysis. You know, we have our, in REM sleep, we have paralysis every single night. Our own actions do it. All they got to do is generate an electrical current across the brain, and bingo, there's your paralysis. It doesn't have to be anything special. It's just complete human manipulation. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe, and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer buy me a coffee because 
that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.